Hey everyone, Glenn here. Before we start our very special episode of the podcast, one that was very difficult difficult to get through, to make this podcast available to everybody for free, uh, we have very loyal and supportive sponsors of the podcast. Ageless Mailmax is one of those sponsors, and they want to know when did it become okay for men to be lazier, softer, and fatter. And we need to bring the men of this country back to greatness. And it's easier than ever with Ageless Male Max. And Ageless Male Max is a patented pending formula with an ingredient that helps boost your total testosterone, which promotes greater increases in muscle size and twice the reduction in body fat percentage than exercise alone. You can take your manhood to the max by trying your first 30-day bottle for free. That's right, for free. Just pay shipping and handling. Not 10 days. We're not talking 15 days but a full 30-day supply for free. And you can do this by texting the word RULE, R-U-L-E, to 797979. Finally, a formula that boosts total testosterone. And if your results with Ageless Male Max are too intense, all you have to do is de- decrease your use. For your free bottle, for your free 30-day sample, is RULE, R-U-L-E, to 797979. That's R U L E to 797979. Message and data rates may apply. We want to thank HS Mail Max for being a loyal sponsor to Dinner with the King. The following show is a Pod Avenue production. You are cordially invited to have Dinner with the King. Pull up a chair and join WWE Hall of Famer. Jerry the King Lawler and Glenn Moore. Enjoy. Welcome to Dinner with the King, episode number 63. I'm co host Glenn Moore, joined here by WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler, sitting in the King's Castle here in Memphis, Tennessee. King, uh, first, uh, I don't. I didn't real, you know, not realize, but I didn't think we'd be back on the air for a while, considering the situation. But um, this is probably one of the hardest podcasts that we'll probably do. Oh yeah, with, without a doubt. Um, before you hit the record button, we were both sitting here saying we don't know how to do this type of podcast. Neither one of us have ever had to do something like this. Um, but you know, it's I, I, I feel like for me, it's going to be a an opportunity to sort of. Uh, vent a little bit and uh, share with my friends out there uh, exactly what the past few days have been like in my life. Uh, it's been the, without a doubt, the roughest thing that I've ever been through in my life. And you know, I lost my dad when I was 19. Lost my mom uh, seven years ago, and now, uh, but. I then lost my brother three years ago. And anytime you lose a family member, everybody out there knows anytime you lose a family member, it is very emotional and it is very tough. But I don't, uh, you know, the old saying is no parent should ever have to bury their child. And until something like that is experienced, you just, you, you, you can't really wrap your head around it. You don't really know uh, what it's like until it happens. And I, I, and I guess, you know, it's something that you think would never happen. I never dreamed it in a million years uh, to get the phone call that I got last week. Um, it was just, it was just devastating. And then, uh, oh man, then all the events. You know, after that, have just been uh, just almost been a blur. It's like you're suddenly living a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people listen to the podcast. Uh, obviously, you know, follow you on social media. They've been following the news and through the Memphis area. It's been all over the news, national too. Um, your son Brian Christopher Lawler um, passed away Sunday. Um, not this past Sunday, but the previous Sunday, and. You gave me the. You called me around midnight Saturday night, um, but I, I there was no voicemail, and I woke up to the phone call. I'm, I, you know, you never call me that late, so it had to be something. And then you texted me, and I called you back. You're at the airport, 
but well, I, I, I was actually in, um, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. They were, I was part of the, uh, big Raleigh super con, the, the big comic con that they were having there in Raleigh and, uh, tons of guests, uh, just a huge turnout, big crowd. A lot of wrestling buddies were there as well. And, um, I was there on Friday and then again there all day Saturday and the show was over for, um, uh, Saturday and I was back at back at the uh, uh, hotel, and my phone rang, and um, there's a gentleman on the other line and said that he was a Hardiman County deputy sheriff, and he said, "Mr. Lawler, I just wanted to call you and tell you that your son Brian has hung himself at the jail," and. I, you know that when you hear something like that, it's just nothing but disbelief. I thought maybe I, I didn't certainly didn't think it was a joke because, you know that that would have been too sick of a sense of humor for anybody to try to pull a rib like that. But so I I knew that it was the real deal, but I just I didn't want to believe it, and I I I just asked him, what did you say? Would you repeat that? And he said. He told me again, and then he said that they have, and I, when I think back on it, it was almost like there was a finality to the way he said it, but then he paused a little bit, and he said, they're transporting your son to Jackson Memorial Hospital, and uh, it was as if somebody, <clears throat> I think somebody was actually telling him in the background that they said we, at first he didn't have a pulse, but now they've they've got a pulse. And he's trying to breathe on his own, and we're taking him to Jackson Memorial, and and that was it. He, he we hung up, and uh, I I I don't know, I can't even remember what I did at, at that time. I think I called Lauren, um, uh, and then just a few minutes later, the deputy called back again and said. They're actually airlifting your son to Memphis <clears throat> to um, uh, the Med in Memphis, which is the main trauma hospital for the entire Mid-South area. And Brian had been in a little town called Bolivar, Tennessee, uh, and that's where they were taking him from. And so, uh, you, you know, I, I, I just um, fortunately I had I had some friends there from Memphis with me. And uh, we started, uh, I, I just didn't really know what to do. Uh, my friend Joe Barton is, a, is an attorney, and he was there with me, and, and he, he started making some calls. Uh, Lauren got on the phone to the WWE and uh, Sue DeRosa, and um, she immediately got hold of our emergency travel, and they, they hooked me up with a flight out of Raleigh. There was nothing that night. I couldn't get. Uh, flight out until early the next morning um, and it was just um, like I said that's that's when the nightmare started I mean I, I, I'm especially not being able I mean you was just I was just felt so helpless I was just stuck there in Raleigh there was nothing I could do until the next morning until I could get on the plane uh, Lauren Lauren immediately went to the hospital her dad went along with her uh got a hold of my other son Kevin they went to uh, the med and uh and then Brian's mom got down there as well and uh I, then I was all I could do was you know just talk to people on the phone about Brian's condition and um I don't know I just kept thinking you know when they said that um that he had a pulse and and he was breathing. Uh, I don't know. I just, I, I, I didn't want to think the worst. So I just, I somehow just kept thinking that, you know, he'll, he'll be able to pull through this, especially they got him at the bed in Memphis, which is a great, a great hospital, great staff there. I just, I felt confident that, you know, this would hopefully somehow turn out all right. And, uh, so in the next, early the next morning, I went to the airport and got the, f the first flight out of uh, Raleigh, connected to Atlanta, and then got back to Memphis, went straight down to the med. And um, 
uh, wow. It was just like, I guess that that's when it really hit me when I walked into the emergency room and, uh, and saw Brian lying there. Uh, and Lauren had told, Lauren had told me before that the, uh, I said some of the nurses had told her that it just, it didn't look good. And, um, and so anyway, but I knew the minute I saw him lying there that basically all that was keeping him alive was the, was the breathing machine. And, you know, that's just, uh, something you just never think that you're going to see in your life. Your son on a, on a, on his deathbed, on his deathbed is just, I don't know. It was, like I said, uh, the only way I can just keep describing it is just like a nightmare. I just kept thinking, this can't be real. You know, this uh, uh, this, this can't really be happening. Um, did they keep him breathing to for you to get there to say goodbye? Was that the whole, was that, because, you know, the nurses said that he wasn't looking good. Was there any hope during the day that he would get through it? Well... Like I said, I, I got there probably around 11 o'clock in the morning and, uh, you know, nothing, nothing changed. I mean, the doctors and nurses would come in and out on occasion and check his, uh, check his blood pressure level. And, um, but then finally about maybe two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they told us they were going to bring in the entire trauma team uh, and the neurology team, and the I, there were like three teams of doctors and nurses that all came in and and just uh, gathered around me and Lauren and and Brian's mom and his brother, and they all each sort of gave a report on what they thought. Um, you know what was going to be the outcome and the neurology people said um that his brain stem was still intact which your brain stem apparently is responsible mainly for keeping your heart beating and keeping you breathing but the rest um uh, apparently the rest of his the rest of his brain they said had been deprived of of oxygen for uh, enough of a length of time to where there was really no no response, no activity there, and uh, they felt like, um, I mean, you know, they they didn't rule out a miracle, but they've said they've never they've never seen someone come back from from where Brian was. And um, that basically all that was keeping him alive was the was the breathing machine. And then the other the other uh, that was the neurology team. And then um, the I guess there's a I think it seems like it was called a pulmonary team or something about his heart and breathing. And they said that um, they they were giving him some sort of. Uh, I don't know some sort of medicine or or in uh, in an IV that was keeping his blood pressure as elevated as it was and his pulse as elevated as it was and they said if we stop that uh, IV that his blood pressure would just steadily go down until until basically his heart would stop beating and um uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I told his mom, I said, I just, I don't think I could live with the fact that I tell somebody to, you know, to turn off a machine that's keeping my son alive. Yeah. So we waited. I mean, for another, uh, it seemed like a couple hours, and then uh, his blood pressure just started going down on its own, and 
the doctor came back in and said, um, he said, this is just kind of prolonging the inevitable now that his blood pressure is going down on its own. Uh, he said, I could keep pumping this stuff into him and it would raise it a little bit, but not as high as it was before. And, and, um, uh, so I just asked him, well, if you keep doing that, I mean, is, is, is there any hope to it? And he just said, not really. So we, we just let him not, uh, put the blood pressure medicine in and sure enough in about, oh, it, it just, it, it really went down fast. I would say within 20 minutes, his blood pressure was down to basically nothing. And then, you know, we just stood there. I held his hand and He just, uh, his heart stopped beating. And that was it. Uh, and we, um, I gotta say the people, the whole staff at the, at the med in Memphis were, they were just awesome people. Um, you know, they really treated us with respect and gave us all the time you wanted to to spend with him. Um, and then uh, we all pretty much said our goodbyes and and then uh, we we left. And you know, it's just uh, at that point just to I don't know I, I can't even go back and realize what we did first or what we you know there were certain things that we that we had to do um, uh, Brian had no uh, you know as young people ordinarily don't want to think about their uh, demise ever so Brian had no you know burial plans or anything thing like that insurance or about anything like that so i mean no like i said no plans for something like that happening so we had to you know we had to um figure out a funeral home that was going to be in charge where they would take him to after the uh autopsy the body and and uh get that lined up and then had to get um oh man you know pick out a casket go and uh, pick out a, a cemetery find the place you know pick out the place for his plotter's final resting place and just you know things that had to be done but just you would never never think you're going to have to do that kind of stuff and I know there's you know a lot of people out there that have been through the same type thing um, I, because I've heard from a ton of people that have been through the this kind of ordeal and it's just something that you just have to I don't know you just have to kind of suck it up and 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 get through it and and keep I don't know just keep going try to be strong for for everybody else but that part is has really been tough for me um the, day, the days after uh, Brian passed, I know on the internet, a ton of stories come out about you know fans interacting with Brian, telling stories of how he stayed after shows to make sure everybody got an autograph or a picture, and their interactions with Brian. Um, a little bit of comfort has to come from that as well for you, just knowing that it seemed like everybody had a great story about meeting Brian or seeing Brian wrestle, whether it was in front of 50 people or 500 people, he was always giving 120% and, um, you know, people sharing those stories on, on social media. I know there's been, a, you know, our email, our social media has blown up with, uh, you know, thousands of messages uh, to you, King, but, um, I'm sure, um, those are, you know, when the time is right, those will be nice to, uh, to read and, 
know that Brian touched a lot of people in, in a good way. Well, yeah, uh, of course. I mean, you know, I've, uh, I think Brian was the kind of guy that uh, was not just a, you know, I mean, he, he was the character, you know, he was Grandmaster Sexay and, and I, I used to say, unfortunately, he was Grandmaster Sexay 24 hours a day. You know, a lot of guys are able to turn on and turn off their WWE personas and their characters and that sort of thing. But what you saw with Brian was what you got. And, uh, you know, going back to, you know, what what caused all of this or why Brian was in the situation that he was in was, um, you know, Brian made some bad bad decisions in his life. Uh, and I, I was... You know, that's one of the things I was trying to, you know, say to him. And when I was talking to him, when he was lying there in the, in the med, you know, uh, and I said, Brian, you know, you have made some bad decisions, but this is obviously the worst if you really made the decision to take your life. You know, I mean, Brian was, Brian had gotten arrested on a, on a DUI charge and the little, he was, he was, uh, apparently coming home from working out at the gym 11 o'clock at night and uh, pulled into his own driveway when the officer turned on the lights and, and, and pulled him over. He was, Brian was already home in his own driveway. And, uh, you know, I, I had many conversations with Brian uh, you know, from the time he got arrested and was in, in jail, even went there to the jail and met with Brian and the sheriff of Hardeman County and uh, in his office had Brian in there. And and Brian was at a point that he needed help. And and um, I think I think he realized it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's just there's there's some things that uh, that went on while Brian was in jail, uh, and they, they had, they had, uh, I, I, he had, was basically, I believe going to have a mandatory, it was his, it was his third DUI and, uh, and, and in Tennessee, I believe that's a mandatory 90 days in jail. And, um, you know, we, we spoke with the sheriff and, and th this, this was a crazy thing. He said, you know, this is going to be the best thing for Brian. He's he needs to get straightened out. He needs to admit he needs some help. We're going to get him some help. We'll get him into a, a rehab program from here. And he said, Jerry, my jail is going to be the best place for Brian for the next few weeks. And uh, he said, I'll personally keep an eye on him, and he'll be safe here. And then, I, then, then, this is what's happened. So, um, stuff there, there's a, there's more to this than we can really talk about now. Um, a lot of people have expressed as I have, um, doubts as to whether that, that Brian really did actually commit suicide. Tennessee Bureau of Investigation is working on investigating what went on at the jail I don't have any results from that yet, but um, I have my doubts as well. We've been contacted by inmates that were in the jail with Brian that said they don't believe uh, what was told uh, is exactly is actually what happened. Uh, been have been contacted by another person who witnessed. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I probably shouldn't say yeah, any, any more okay, because yeah, this, don't. this investigation is going to be ongoing and it may take a long time for this to all get sorted out. But, uh, you know, I, I don't want to believe that Brian committed suicide, but by the same token, you know, if, if there was something else involved, I, you know, we certainly want, it's, it's not going to bring Brian back. It, I don't know if it will make it better or worse uh but we just want to know what really 
actually happen because right now there's a there's a, a lot of doubt and a lot of questions that are going to have to be answered in the next few months. I know we can't talk about a lot of things surrounding this, but I know a lot of people will say, well, it's part of the grieving process, you know, denying what, what took place. But, you know, you know, and I know that there's a lot of strange circumstances surrounding this that makes you believe this is not just part of the grieving process. There could be something more to this than oh, just meets the eye. Well, absolutely. I mean, even, um, you know, uh, even if it is proven to be what they said, if he hanged himself in jail, how is a person that is in jail supposed to be able to have something to hang themselves with? Right. That, you know, that shouldn't happen. And so there's there's just a lot of questions, and, and the answers that have given, been given so far, uh, you know, my, my attorney uh, just looked at this and just said his exact words were said, Jerry, this doesn't pass the smell test. I mean, something, something seems not right about this whole thing. So, uh, you know, we've been, we've had so many people have reached out. It's, it's funny. We just, I, I just let you hear a message from phone message from, uh, Dwayne Johnson, the rock. And, and he said in that message, you know, how close he was with Brian. And he said, I never knew Brian to be, suicidal or would even think about something like that and and that's just that just to me you know wasn't brian so um you know i mean some yeah i i just i just have my doubts and you may say hey you're just you don't want to face the inevitable uh but i really i really believe there's more to this than meets the eye yeah yeah definitely and uh, i believe it all will come out and, you know, whenever how long it takes, the, I think the, the truth will come out. But uh, and I know you mentioned too that Brian, you know, he wanted to help other people go, w- that went through the same situation he did. He wanted to be able to get clean himself, help himself, but also help other people to clean their their lives up. And that doesn't sound like someone that is yeah wanting to take their life. Exactly. I, that was one of the things that he told the sheriff in that meeting that uh, that he knew he needed help and he wanted to get help and once he got straightened out that was what he wanted to spend his time doing was you know working with people that were in the same you know in the same boat brian was in and um oh it's just um uh, it's just it's mind-boggling you you lay awake at night thinking what could have been done differently uh how did we get to this point? What could, um, you know, what could have really happened? It's just, it's just, you know, hard to go to sleep. That's all that's on your mind. And then, you know, I swear every morning since then, I, is the minute I wake up and the realization comes back to me, I, I first hope that it was just a dream, that it was just a nightmare. But then, you know, just in a matter of minutes, you realize, nope, this has really happened. And it's, it's, you know, it's just, uh, real. I, you know, I don't even know what else to, to ask. I know you said you wanted to vent. Well, I mean, I, uh, well, when you asked me, did I, you know, did I want to go ahead and do the podcast? And, and I just, I said, I, I we might as well because I'm I it would give maybe actually give me a chance to you know to talk and say some stuff so I mean so many people so many people thousands and thousands and on Twitter and social media and and then uh, at at the actual uh, service for Brian you know so many people have reached out to us with their well wishes and their thoughts and the condolences and all of that sort of stuff and I, I just I wanted to have a chance to say thank you to all of those people out there that have had us in their thoughts and prayers through this difficult time um we we you know we had to have brian's uh uh funeral service the other day and um 
you know, I, and I got to say, uh, my gosh, Lauren has been like a rock. She yeah. has been amazing as far as, you know, keeping things, uh, keeping the boat afloat, so to speak, to keep uh, keeping me above water. Uh, I would I would never have been able to, uh, you know, get everything done that she was able to get done for the, like I said, you know, uh, the picking out the casket and the, and the burial plot and the cemetery and then, of course, putting the service together. It turned out to be a beautiful way. There was like over a 1,000 people that came to Hope Church here in Memphis. Uh, and and uh, I don't know. I just, I, you know, sat there. First of all, we had visitation for like three hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with Brian's casket open, and every all of those thousands of people came through, and and uh, we got to shake hands with each and every one of them, and and hear their so many of them had a had a story about Brian, and 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 that part was, um, you know, that really helped with the grieving, to, and and to just to see how many other people, you know, were were grieving along with us, uh, it was it was really special. But the Brian and and you you Glenn you came down. Uh, some people came from all over the country. You came down for from Cleveland for the service, and it was it was um you know it was just a, it was an amazing service. It was like Lauren and I had talked uh, about a actually my my brother's funeral three years ago, and Brian was there, and um, you know there was there was a a preacher that. Uh, and I and I, I don't want to sound disrespectful, and I don't want to sound, you know, like not religious or anything like that. But but sometimes you go to a funeral, and and it's it's just kind of a down, more sad than almost than it should be. And the and the preacher is almost like preaching a Sunday sermon to the people. And and when we left my brother's funeral, Brian said, "Oh my gosh, you know, if you ever have to." do something like this for me don't have you know don't have that kind of service right and so um uh lauren met with the pastor uh of hope church his name was eli eli morris right eli morris and uh he had actually we had we had seen him once before he had actually preached the service for my uh, another former wrestler and he was my next door neighbor growing up kid named mike mashburn mike passed away from cancer not all that long ago and Eli did his service and uh we got a chance to talk to him before Brian's service and we you know we told him uh, we we wanted this to be a celebration of Brian's life and not something that would that would be somber and sad and and um he was the best I mean it, it, he 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 made the service so uh uh so great in the fact that it was it was a celebration i mean there certainly were the, some sad points the you know the music uh some sad songs and and then but then right after the sad songs we had several you know friends and wrestlers and people speak about brian and uh they were all very uplifting and and that was all good and then uh, they played a great video of brian which was uh, that it brought tears to everybody's eyes just to see you know once again just to see brian up there on that big screen uh doing what well just brian being grandmaster sex a again um and then we had the we had dave brown with the 10 bell salute and um it was just uh, thanks to th- thanks to the pastor uh, eli it was it was just a fantastic service you know it was it, it, it couldn't have been better i know it would have made you know, it it would have been exactly what Brian would have wanted for himself. Yeah, couldn't have been better. Uh, before you wrap up here, is there anything else you want to say to anybody or then about? I mean, this is like I said, your podcast. Say anything you want. You well, know. no, I mean, no, I'm I'm really kind of done venting. Uh, as as I told everybody earlier, you know, this is not over. Uh, the grieving process certainly is not over. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, Pastor Eli told us. You know, you're going to have good days, you're going to have bad days, but you just got to somehow keep keep going forward. Lauren has been amazing for me. 
uh, and she knows when I'm having a good day or a bad day, and she's been right there for me throughout this. Um, you know, Brian's brother, Kevin, you know, he had a big part in the, um, you know, in planning the uh, service, and he's been, you know, he's he's been uh, good. I kind of, I, you know, I, Lauren and I talk to, you know, I kind of worry about him, and I need to, this makes you realize, you know, you need to, I need to stay closer in touch with him, and, um, you know, I, I don't know. I told somebody, I said, you know, if you got kids, tell them you love them because I didn't do that enough with Brian. King, I love you, man. I'm always going to be here for you. Thank you. And thank, I want to say thank you again to everybody that's reached out. It's been, it meant a whole lot. We'll talk to everybody next week here on uh, Dinner with the King. <laughs>